What's up, you data-hungry Amazon sellers? This is your host, Tommy Berenger of the Sell, Rank, Win podcast for Merchant Words. And in this podcast, we give you the answers to your most burning questions, actionable insights that you can take away and implement into your business today. So let's go ahead and dive right into today's episode. What do you say? Let's go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Sell, Rank, Win podcast. I am your host, Tommy Berenger. And as always, we have a very special guest on with us today. He has 15 years of experience in the e-commerce industry and has been helping e-commerce sellers diversify their business for over seven years. He's also the founder and CEO of Blue Tusker, which is a full-service marketing company for e-commerce sellers. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Andrew Maeve. How you doing, Andrew? Doing good. How you doing? I'm good, brother. I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad. I uh, loved that. That was like a like I just got invited into like WrestleMania or something. That you was know, awesome. right? Appreciate yeah. that. The, ring, the ringmaster over here trying to make it happen. <laughs> What's his name again? The announcer, the famous announcer. Oh, the Ready to Rumble guy. Yeah. Um. Oh, I don't know what off the top of my head. Ah. Uh, I'm not even gonna try. Yeah. I don't, yeah. <laughs> anyways, anyways, but yeah, I should have started it out with "Let's get ready to run," but that would have been fun. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe on my next podcast, I'll do that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we were. Uh, uh, me, me, and Andrew were just kind of chopping it up about some a little bit of uh, fantasy. What, what's, what is the secret that we listen to on Sirius XM? Uh, <laughs> which is, which is, should we tell, should we let the the fantasy people know out there the channel that they no. need to listen to? No. We're, we're <laughs> How not, am I gonna we're win? Not doing it? We're keeping our secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they could Google it and figure it out. Anyway, I know. All right, <laughs> I know, right? How am I going to win? Anyways, I think every single guy in my league listens to the same damn show. But anyways, um, <laughs> uh, where where are you at in the world, Andrew? I'm in Westchester, Pennsylvania. So I'm basically just outside Philadelphia. Awesome, cool man, cool, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, what do you say? You want to you want to dive in? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So I want to know, how did you make your way into the digital marketing space way back 15, 16 some years ago? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so my, okay. So when I started, my father owned a e-commerce company. He sold shocks, like car shocks. Um, and they had, they bought this company that was like real small and he grew it into this massive like multi-million dollar company and I he needed help in the warehouse and I said fine but I've known since I was a kid that I wanted to get into marketing so I was like I'll help you out in the warehouse but um I also want like just some kind of insight into the marketing side so that's pretty much where it started I was basically an intern for my father um and I would like kind of help out on some like email marketing things like that back then um then as time went on I was in the music industry for a while. I was in a band and we all had like our own role outside of obviously, you know, playing an instrument. And so I was in charge of promoting our shows and booking our stuff. And basically, long story short, I ended up booking, I ended up starting a company where I booked all of the concerts in pretty much most of Central Florida. And so like tours would come through and I would end up being the one promoting and stuff. And then after a while, I started to hate it because it was just the music industry is horrible. But the venues would ask me to help them promote stuff. And then every now and then they would have like just like, you know, a night where they were just doing a party or something. And so I basically ended up getting into hospitality and doing marketing there. Then as time went on there, ended up merging the company that I had created, which is basically at that point now an agency with a family member who was doing something relatively similar, but more on like a retail brick and mortar side. Um, So we merged that company. I ended up exiting that one because working with family is always awesome. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I went in house to a couple places, try to kind of like, you know, change it up a little bit. Um, and then I just, I, I really enjoy the agency life of just being able to kind of, I really like helping other businesses and I really like changing up what I do every day. Um, so then I, I, uh, about five, five or six years ago, started an agency with a partner of mine. We ended up selling that in September of 2019 to a public company. And then in January 2020, I left and started Blue Tusker, and now I'm here. Very cool, very cool. That's awesome. So helping pops out with the shocks, and I was also <laughs> I used to be. My dad had a um, uh, he was a mechanic, and I would be at his shop, 
and I would help him out sometimes too. So it's always fun helping out pops, right? And then another (laughs) thing that I did not know is, you know, we're getting to know each other here. As you were in the music industry, I was in the music industry too. And we're both kind of made a total 180 here. So we got to go grab a beer sometime here. Yes, absolutely. Feels like it. What did you, were you a, uh, what, were you a musician? Producer, songwriter, and and it it was just, you know, um, it it was just up and down, you know, all the time. So just had to, had to change it up and do something else. Oh, I'm, I'm the exact opposite. I was a drummer. So like, yeah, I I can't write music. I can't read music. I literally just, I just come in and and make as much friggin' noise as I possibly can. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, man, like that's a, that's an art. Yeah. It, I mean, I didn't read music either i just you know i had a partner who was able to do that but i just played by ear and then just kind of you know moved on that way but i mean this is a whole nother podcast maybe we should start like um um, almost made it musicians podcast or something (laughs) (laughs) oh man cool cool stuff cool stuff okay so blue tusker tell us a bit about blue tusker your company and how you help (laughs) uh, amazon brands there Yeah. So we are a full service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers. And basically we help in all aspects of digital marketing with e-commerce sellers. That means that they could be solely on on Amazon or they could be, which tends to be the case with the uh, people that we work with. They're looking to diversify typically away from Amazon just because of the constant intricacies and BS of Amazon suspending you because they got bored basically. And So what we really help do is create kind of an omni-channel experience where they can, uh, we basically help sellers, you know, obviously develop their brands off Amazon on their own websites, but also help them kind of get established into other marketplaces like eBay or Walmart or, you know, Wayfair, depending obviously on the product line. Very cool. Awesome. 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 Um, Now I wanted to, to dive into different traffic methods that you see working best for those Amazon sellers. And now I know there's different variables, uh, but overall, what traffic methods do you see working the best currently? (laughs) So it's it's funny you ask this. So, cause I actually just did a video about this um, Ah. earlier this week. So it's like, give it 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 to me and I'll link it. Uh, I'll link it. I'll link it in the, uh, um, in, in the podcast. So send it to me. Yeah, we'll do. Um, so, all right. So you're, I'm going to go on a rant here. So you're go for it. You're on, rant Amazon, away. you're on Amazon. You're ready to diversify off Amazon. What's the next step, right? So basically what I always say is make sure you have your brand registered and create that storefront. And then what you want to do is start driving your display ads to the storefront. That's pretty standard. But the reason you want to do that is just to be able to prove out that you can actually convert from that storefront from there. What I usually suggest to do is either Facebook ads or Google ads, and that's going to be dependent on your product. So if you think about a product where you have a uh, a solution to a problem that people know that exists, right? So maybe you've created you know, a better water bottle or something like that. There's pretty decent consider that's a horrible example but like <laughs> like let, you know let's say you've basically created something that people are actively searching for google's going to always have your better conversion rates because these people know what they're looking for and their mm-hmm. intent is to find a, a solution so they're, Whereas, further, they're further down the funnel there yeah basically. exactly yeah Whereas on Facebook, if you are basically presenting a new solution to a problem that people already have, that's when you want to be able, there's a level of education you have to have. So that's when I would suggest using Facebook. I usually suggest driving traffic directly to the storefront once you've proven that out, because you can leverage that custom source code in the back end, use Mm -hmm. that code in your Google ad or in your Facebook ad, so you can actually track, you know, how it's doing. And be able to justify like, okay, Facebook's working for me. I now know that I can take an off Amazon audience, drive them to Amazon and convert. The best part about doing it on Facebook is that you can narrow down your audience to people that have an interest in Amazon, just in case, even though everyone, their mother uses Amazon, just in case you end up targeting people that don't like shopping on Amazon, you can mm-hmm. usually weed them out by narrowing that audience down. Um, but usually I would start with those two. Use that custom source code so that you can prove out like, okay, I can actually convert with an off Amazon audience. 
And then that's where you go, okay, what do we want to do next? Do we want to go into other uh, marketplaces? None of them that I'm aware of have any kind of custom source code. So it makes it difficult to drive off Amazon traffic or off <laughs> off marketplace traffic. Um, so usually that's when I suggest that's when you're going to start going into your website and things like that. Um, but if you're talking about like, you know, off, off Amazon traffic, that is typically the route that I take it. Very cool. And then something else I wanted to ask you about um, is they have, they're, they're starting to reward you for sending outside traffic, Amazon that is, um, yeah. in, in it's, I forgot the exact name of the program, but it is, and I'm sure you know what it is, but um, they're, they're rewarding you by reducing some of your fulfillment fees, I believe. Um, and I think, is that tracked by that same source code? It's tracked by something different. Um, so basically, basically what happened there was, you know, Amazon had that affiliate program. They've had it forever where, you know, you could basically just sign up and become an affiliate. You don't have to really be anyone. You could just do it. And then you would get a commission for every product that was purchased through your affiliate code. Well, a lot of sellers caught on to that. And because they wanted to stay on Amazon, they would drive off Amazon traffic through the affiliate code because mm. they knew if they got a sale, then they, it would obviously be reflected in the affiliate code and they would get to recoup some of the money that FBA they're, was stealing from them. They're do double dipping, right? Exactly. So Amazon <laughs> caught on to it. And for a while there, they were doing what they could to like stop that from happening. But in my opinion, Amazon basically figured out like we're not we're not going to win this battle and they're going to do it anyway. But why do we hate it? Because they're driving traffic from off of it, from off of our website and driving it back to our site. So why don't we encourage them to keep doing this? So they put a different plan together specifically for sellers where they can now do this. I still don't personally love it because you still aren't owning any of the customer data. So you're still losing all that, right. which is obviously a different conversation. but. That is yeah. uh, that is definitely another way to go. Sometimes the struggle is you have to go directly to one product. So if you only have one product, that's you know it, it's probably nice to be able to do it that way. Um, but if you have a larger product line, I usually still suggest sending them to the storefront just so that they can see everything that you have to offer. Yeah, definitely, and that helps create more of a brand uh, brand awareness and brand presence. I think when you run those display ads to the storefront. Um, which is, I think the first strategy you said, like digging, when you dig into the brand, um, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of doing a little bit of a brand audit. I would assume when a brand comes on and if, you know, what if it's a smaller brand, would it still make sense to drive those display ads to the storefront? Uh, so by a smaller brand, you mean like maybe they only have like one or two products? Like, yeah, like, like maybe one to, to five products or so, something like that. Um, I mean, if they have like, if you have three or more, you can right. fill in all those extra holes on the on the um, display ads. Right. Um, I think if you have less, you can still do it too. I think there's there's I don't think there's a limitation on it. To be honest, it's been a while since I've done one with less than you know three products in it. Mm -hmm. um, but even if you're that small, like I would still do it. The reason I the other reason that I suggest doing it is because when you send people to your storefront, there's no ads on your storefront. Like there's right. you know there's no competition when you send them to a listing. You have all those different like frequently bought together that may not be you or sponsored products or other people re reviewed. Like there's so many things that can really deter someone from shopping on your specific product that if you keep them on your storefront and even some of those um, options give you the, the option for someone to just buy it right off the storefront without having to go to the listing. So if you can do it that way, it's even better because you're keeping the competition out of the way. Yeah, just keeping them there and then uh, less of a chance to lose a conversion, right? So just drive yeah. them right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Definitely makes sense. Cool. Uh, so what, I mean, speaking of display ads, what other types of ads within Amazon do you see working the best? And I know this, you know, it always depends on a lot of things, but overall, what do you see working best for like, I guess, a semi-established brand, I would say? Sponsored products. I mean, sponsored you know, products. Yeah, live live and die by the original. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it's it, right. It's just you know, it's it's so easy to really hone in on exactly what's working and then just separate it out and jack that bit up and basically own a spot. I mean, honestly, like it, it makes it so much easier that way. Um, the 
you know, the product display ads uh, can work really well, especially on like, I, you know, a lot of people use them for offense. Like they'll go and run ads on a competitor's listing. I actually mm-hmm. really like separating out the campaigns and doing a little bit of defense too, where you run ads on your own stuff so that you can yep. keep the competitors out. Mm-hmm. Um, so every now and then I'll see that work pretty well. <clears throat> the um, I'm a little disappointed with the DSP ads, you know, the, the off Amazon stuff that runs back to Amazon. You know, they're, I get that they're retargeting and, th- and you know, they're also giving you the option to hit new audiences and stuff. But the problem with that that I've always found is like you can't negate anyone that ended up purchasing a competitor. So you could end up running retargeting ads to someone that already purchased someone else and you're just wasting your time. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them. I rarely see that much benefit from them unless you have like a massive product line and you have the budget to just say screw it i want brand awareness all day long in which case then they're fine but otherwise those are probably the ones i would go the other way with and say not a big fan got yeah and for one of my products it actually has been working pretty fairly well it's not like my number one um ad that i'm running that's getting me the most traffic but it is giving me a few sales here and there and the a cost is really low so but for some of my other and it's a niche very niche product so maybe that's why i don't know but but um some of my other products it's not working as well um Mm -hmm. but i just keep running you know of course if it's if it's working you know if it's not broken don't fix it right just keep it let it run let it run let it run as soon as you see something go crazy then of course you got to uh you got to adjust those bids or you know to add some more negative keywords or, or products or whatever. Yeah. Um, cool. Cool. So I want to know how are you creating a holistic brand presence for these Amazon sellers, these Amazon brands? Um, I, I, I know that's a broad, I know that's a broad question. I mean, it, it is, but it's really not like, to be honest, like I, I'd, I'd hate to say that what we do here is easy, but it's kind of easy. Like basically like you, <laughs> these Amazon sellers, like, you know, they're, if you're just an Amazon seller, you're, mm-hmm. you're a different breed of person usually, they, <laughs> but they, they are really, they work so hard on, you know, just small little, like, I want to see like a 0.5% increase on this and that. And, you know, with the amount of effort that they put into that, when you could be focusing on expanding into other areas, you know, they would be a lot of these people that are solely on Amazon, they would kill it off Amazon just because of the way that they run their business. But like when it comes to the omni-channel stuff, like you spent so much time uh, putting together this awesome listing with these, you know, you worked real hard on the copy and focusing on the keywords and you put some great call outs and infographics and stuff like that in your imagery. And you great, you built out some great A plus content and you did all this stuff. And then I see sellers like, you know what, let's go try Walmart. And they just take like one crappy product picture, throw it up on the listing, just make a couple bullet points and be like, why aren't we getting sales on Walmart? Be like, yeah. well, That's why. Like it looks nothing like your Amazon account. And then when you think about the brand as a whole, I've seen sellers before where their Amazon sales will actually suffer because of theoretically uh, the poor approach that they took to any other marketplace or their own website. Because Mm -hmm. like, so like to give you an example, my wife does not buy anything on Amazon unless she has done like a full investigation behind the company. And so she'll go, yeah. I'm I'm like totally, I'm like totally the opposite. Like if I see something, I'm like, if I see like an Instagram ad on something, I'm just going to, I'm like, okay, that looks cool. I'm going to look for it on Amazon. You know what I mean? It's just like here, Amazon's like my (laughs) go-to. Yeah. So she'll do something. She's, she's definitely guilty of that too or she'll basically like see some like cool inst- she's she every time something arrives at her house i'm like fucking instagram but like <laughs> but like she'll so she'll see something cool on instagram but she'll always look into their site and look into their social and see what they're posting mm-hmm. and then and then she'll figure out where can i buy it and a lot of times what i've noticed from just watching her shop is basically if she goes to their site and their site is kind of crappy and she doesn't like uh-huh. it then she's not going to purchase from them. And there's been times where she's found stuff on Amazon that she thought was cool and she'll leave to see like, okay, this is sold by so-and-so. Let me see if maybe I can help them and buy on their site because she knows she hears me complain all day. So she knows it's better to buy their site. Um, But if she goes to their site and it sucks, she's like, uh, this is sketchy and I don't think I want this product anymore. 
And it's the same concept as if you're running ads and someone goes to Amazon like you did, then if it looks great, obviously you'll probably purchase. But if you preferred Walmart and you went to Walmart and the listing looked like crap, you you might think it's a knockoff or something, in which case you're like, oh, I don't know if I want this. So you have mm-hmm. to have like the same level of branding like the amount of effort you put in your Amazon listings and your your creative and your copy, you have to put that same amount of effort into everything else that you do. Otherwise, it's going to end up hurting you all around. You know what? Yeah, that's very true. And I think it also varies from from product to product or from type what type of brand to type of brand. You know, I think, you know, for sure if it's like a clothing company, I think you to- I totally agree you have to go out there and see um, you know, see the rest of you know, the e-commerce world behind it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's like, I don't know, like a, I don't know, maybe a hammer or something. I don't know. I, I can't think of a product off the top of my head. Uh, maybe not a hammer, but something like that. Just, you know, it's just a quick, a quick little buy, you know, for me personally, I don't need to do all that research, but I totally get yeah. that with those other big brands for sure. And those other types of products. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, actually the hammer's not a bad example. Like if you just kind of created another hammer, then mm-hmm. yeah, either you need to do, you have to do something that differentiates you because there's God knows yep. how many hammers in this world. So at <laughs> that point, then the question is, you still need to probably do a, go a little over the top on your branding because most hammers don't, or you need to be very cost effective, in which case you're just out pricing everyone. And then yep. I don't care what your listing looks like if I need a cheap hammer. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Right. Um, and then you got to be careful of that race to the bottom on price guys. All right. Well, yeah. Always preach that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, we, we could go into, I mean, Andrew, you know, we could, we could have like three other podcast, uh, episodes. I, think. <laughs> I might have to bring you on as a regular. We'll see. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool. Sounds good. Um, so another thing I wanted to speak to you about, because I know, you know, your stuff, um, is influencers. So. I think that more and more brands are starting to utilize them, especially over the past couple of years. Um, what do you see, like as far as the Amazon private, private label brands, um, what do you see the impact of using an influencer for these Amazon, these brand sellers? Oh, I love them. I yeah. think they're great. I think I think that if you know how to do it correctly without, because most of the time, depending on obviously like, you know, who you're talking to, if we're talking to like a company that's doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year, then yeah, go hire Kim Kardashian and do what you got to do. But if you're, you know, under eight figures, or you just broke eight figures, and you have, you know, a budget that you have to work with, then in my opinion, on the influencer side, you have all these big companies that you could go to, right? Like you have Grin, you have Coley, where you can essentially like have access to all of these relatively known influencers, like people who refer to themselves as influencers. But you'd be shocked at how many people I know that have 10,000 followers that have great engagement. And they're not bloggers. They're not influencers. They just happen to have a lot of followers. Like I have a buddy of mine who's he's a he's a good looking guy. I guess that's why a lot of people follow him. But he's he's an idiot. Like no one no one's following him for the content he's putting out. It's just the pictures that they like but every, he's got a crazy engagement. And I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. you don't understand. Like a brand will just pay you thousands of dollars to post something just for the sake of it. And he's like, nah, that's not really what I want to do. But if you took the time as a seller to like, go, go find like an admin on Upwork that can just like scrape people that are in your industry that you think would do well and get their Instagram information, develop like a really nice template to DM them and just start, start conversations with them. And build your own like your own community of influencers that you think works. When you do product launches, what I always suggest to do is do a like once you've built this list, do a big outreach to all these influencers and say, hey, you know, whatever deal you have with them, whether you're sending them free product or you're paying them or both or whatever, figure that stuff out and then say, I'm gonna send you this new product. I want you to do this with it and you know, create whatever pictures or video that you need. And then I want you to all post it at the same time and be, do it all like in one month. So like, okay, our new product's coming out in June. I want every single influencer to post during the month of June. So when you have these issues of like, okay, I got a new product. How do I get more reviews? How do I like, how do I start this snowball effect? It is definitely one hell of a way to get that snowball effect going by just all of a sudden, all the influencers that you follow 
all have been posting about this one product, it's a great way to kick that snowball effect off. Guys, rewind this back. That was straight gold right there. Value bomb <laughs> right there. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's as simple as going to, like you said, going to Upwork, going to Fiverr, hire, hiring one of these VAs um, to go ahead and scrape people in your industry amongst all of, uh, you know, some different, um, some different profiles. Get that, try to reach out to them and see if they can post for you. And then another thing I wanted to ask you about is what, what, um, what do you think about u- utilizing nano influencers? I prefer them. You prefer Most them? Of, okay. like, I usually don't look at, um, I'm, we'll look at follower count. Like I usually want to have someone, like we're talking about Instagram, you know, TikTok and all that's a different ball game, but if we're talking about Instagram, usually I want them to have about 10,000 followers just so that I know they have the swipe up feature on their story because right. I'm going to want them to do a story. And obviously I want them to swipe to have the swipe up option. Um, but outside of that, I don't really focus on follower numbers. I focus on the engagement versus their follower numbers because you could have, there's so many people out there that have hundreds of thousands of followers and get like 15 likes every time they post something, which is immediately obvious that they're not like they bought all of them or they bought the account or, you know, they somehow scammed their way into, they did one of those follower group things that whatever the hell happened there that everyone created, like that kind of stuff, like it never works. So I always make sure like I'm more focused on the quality of the people that are engaging with it than I am like how many followers you may have. Yeah, that's so important. And and one of my guests that I had on, I think it was the episode uh, before this one or a couple episodes before Willie Lynn, um, he reached in, 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 when he started out, he, he was selling these kitchen knives or some, or knife sharpener, excuse me. And then he started going after these nano influencers. And this one nano influencer had 1200 subscribers on uh, their their YouTube account, and then from the one video they did on his knife sharpener, he got 800 sales. So the engagement was insane from that, you know. Yeah. So it's like almost <laughs> everyone, every subscriber, pretty much bought something from from him, which is nuts. Yeah, I mean uh, that's the thing too with YouTube that's that's difficult with YouTube influencers is that you know you can look at how many subscribers they have because obviously once they release a video, that person will get a notification, but what you don't know is how many of their, how many people are just like casually looking for that type of video, right? Like, cause then you're looking at more of like an SEO side. So even though that influencer only had like 1200 followers or subscribers, he -hmm. might be getting like, who knows how many, you know, different people viewing the video as opposed to usually with like other social platforms. Most of the time they are really only getting eyeballs of their existing followers. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously they got the followers one way or another, so that's not always the case. Yeah. Very cool stuff. They, I mean, Andrew, thank you so much for, for dropping these value bombs on us. Um, and we like to keep these podcasts short and sweet. I know we could probably keep going on and on <laughs> and on here, uh, but I like to keep them short and value packed, um, for our listeners. Um, so I'm, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. And at the end of every show, I'd like our guests to go ahead and give our listeners at least one tip or trick that they can take away after listening to this podcast and implement it inside of their life or inside of their business. So what do you got for us? Oh man, I knew this question was coming and I was not prepared for it. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Thanks. So. Oh, I believe, I, I believe I in you. One. I believe in you, Andrew. Okay. So this, I, I've worked with it's so many businesses at this point and it blows my mind that this is never the case. Get a, get a project management system and treat it like an SOP. So to give you an example, us internally, we use Asana. They're all kind of the same. So use whatever you want, but we have specific projects for everything that we do, right? So let's say, you know, we're building an Amazon listing. I have a specific project that is for Amazon listings that is a template. So basically, obviously for us, when we work with someone new, I'll just duplicate that template and I'll have the process ready to go right there. So I know exactly what I need to do. But as we learn new things, so as we're attending different conferences, we're listening to amazing podcasts like this one, and we learn some awesome information. I go back into the template and I adjust it based on what I learned so that next time I have to do it, I remember to do it. It's, it's like, it's 
it it's such common sense to me and it blows my mind that no one does this because you learn new stuff every day and you're like, oh, I want to remember to do that. And then no one ever does it. Like how many times have you gone to a conference? You're like, oh, I got to remember to do that. And then you yeah. never do it. But if you have something as simple as like, it's just one little like extra task you got to remember to do next time. Or if you're doing product launches, every time you launch a product, go back and insert what you learned so that next time you learn a pro- you do a product launch, you know exactly how to do it. It has it streamlines operations. I know we've talked mostly about like marketing and stuff, but on an operational side, that that crap's a game changer. SOPs, guys, that's very important. I mean, just like Andrew was saying, as simple as remembering something, jotting it down or adding it into uh, one of the platforms you use, if you use a larger platform like Asana or something of the sort. But, you know, it's in- important to keep that down, especially for Amazon sellers, like Andrew was mentioning, you know, your launch process, your launch process could change, you know, I mean, way back when we all remember when we could buy reviews, that was part of the launch process. So we had to rip that out of the launch process because you can't buy reviews anymore, right? And, mm-hmm. and don't do it if people reach out to you and say, you want me to uh, give you some reviews? Don't do it. Trust me, please <laughs> don't do it. But anyways, Preach. yeah, right. So awesome stuff, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, and if you could let the people out there know uh, where can they find you? How can they contact you if they want to get a hold of you to utilize your services over at Blue Tusker? All of our social is at Blue Tusker. So B L U E T U S K R. Um, there's no E in Tusker. And then all of my socials at Andrew Math. Just I honestly like I. This is what I do like all day. I love just like helping and just like give try challenge me come on like just tweet me something ridiculous and tell me <laughs> I can't market it and I will prove you wrong. I don't know. I don't know how I got so competitive at it, but do it. Just tweet me. I'll figure it out. Or Facebook or Instagram or whatever else. I don't have a TikTok. <laughs> Love it. Very cool. No, no TikTok. I, I have one to like <laughs> to to view and like. I'm still trying to like with certain clients and stuff. We're ch- still trying to figure out like what's the best approach to this because it changes like every other week. But I oh, don't yeah. have I don't have one myself that I'm like actively using. Not yet. I'm Got sure it. I no, no, it. no dances from blue, from Andrew blue Tusker yet. Right. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Got One it. day. We'll let, we'll <laughs> notify you guys uh, when that happens. Uh, <laughs> so Andrew, I just want to, you know, thank you so much for coming on. I know you're a super busy guy. Um, and thank you for coming on. And I foresee us having some other, um, episodes in the future. I mean, th- this is some good stuff for you really know your stuff. Um, and thank you for coming on brother. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I would be more than happy to come back. Sounds like a plan. (laughs) Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. And if you got any value out of this podcast at all, please let us know at the place that you listen to it at, whether it be iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is, give us some love, give us an awesome review and let us know maybe uh, some things you want us to talk about on the next podcast. Till next time, guys, stay awesome and be awesome. awesome.